hi, fellas. Be right with you. Hi, Uncle Bob. Take your time, no hurry. Hi, Mr. Udy. Hi, Jack. Dick, been playing ball? No, not yet. We were just going out and back. <laughs> well, here you are, Ed. As good as new. Well, thanks, Bob. How much do I owe you? Oh, two dollars ought to do it. Thank you, Ed. Well, thanks again. So long, fellas. Have a good game. We will. Bye, Mr. Udy. Bye. Well, you two boys look raring to go. Have a big game lined up? No, just some of the guys are going to work out for a while. Oh. Why don't you come out with us, Uncle Bob? We need a good pitcher. Oh, thanks, fellas. I wish I could. I certainly need the exercise. Now, business is business, you know. And speaking of that, what can I do for you gentlemen? Dad asked me to bring this camera over to you. Huh? What's wrong with it, Dick, you know? Dad says it's liver over here. Sticks. Oh. Oh, I see. Sure, well, I think that can be fixed, all right. You know, I think being able to take pictures is terrific. It is terrific, Jack. Man really came up with something when he invented and developed the marvel of photography. Who invented photography? Well, that's hard to say for sure. But way back in the 18th century, a chemist over in Sweden was the first one to experiment with the effects of sunlight on silver chloride. And I guess you could say that started other experiments and ideas. But you know, the first camera was made long before that. You mean we had cameras before we even knew about photography? That's just what I mean, Dick. You see, the human eye is the most delicate and marvelous camera in existence. In fact, this camera is just a man-made eye. But it can't compare with your eyes, fellas. Look here. This is the lens of the camera, and it's made along the same principle as the lens of our eye. Now, if we focus a camera on an object, and then we change the distance between the camera and that object, the image becomes blurred, and we have to focus the camera all over again. And that focusing has to be done by hand, you see, just like this. However, in our eye, the focusing is all done automatically. Now, we move around seeing things from different angles and distances all the time. Strong muscles in our eyes change the focus thousands of times each day, and we never even give it a thought. How about that? Yeah, I never knew that. And that's not all. You see this little opening in the lens? Now, that's called the iris, and it controls the amount of light that gets into the camera to expose the film. Now, we can open and close the iris like this. Now, the camera's iris gets its name from the iris of our eye. The eye's iris automatically opens and closes to adjust for different amounts of light. The more light, the smaller the iris. The less light, the wider the iris opens. That's terrific, Uncle Bob. <laughs> our eyes are amazing little instruments. But you know, they're only one part of the wondrous body that God has given us. This house we live in is made up of many remarkable things. Come on in here a minute. Now take a look out there at your buddies playing ball. Now you don't see still pictures, do you? No. No, of course not. The pictures that the eye gives us are moving pictures. And they're not silent pictures either. They're sound pictures. That's right, they are. That's because we have ears, huh? That's because we have ears. What about these ears of ours? Watch your head. You know, I suppose most of us just think of our ears as a couple of things sticking out of the side of our head that are so easy to get dirty, but oh, so hard to get clean, huh? <laughs> uh, actually, the human ear is one of the most efficient sound detectors known a very delicate and sensitive instrument that operates in a remarkable way. Think of how a piano sounds when it's played. Do you realize that the sound you hear is played all over again on a perfect little musical instrument inside your ear? You see, the piano is really just producing sound waves. And when these vibrations reach our brain, then we hear the tones. As the keys are struck, felt hammers hit the strings, causing them to vibrate. Now, each pulsating string 
sets the air around it vibrating in the same way. These vibrations or waves in the air are picked up by the outer ear, go down the auditory canal, and are carried by the bones of the middle ear to the cochlea, which is all rolled up like a tiny seashell. If the cochlea could be stretched out, we would discover an instrument very much like the piano, except that it is much more wonderful, for the cochlea has more than 24,000 strings. When a piano is played, the ear's remarkable keyboard plays the same tones and sends signals along the nerves to the brain where we perceive it as sound. Of course, the outer ear operates in air, but the cochlea is filled with a liquid. And transferring sound waves from air to a liquid is one of the most difficult problems known to science. But in the ear, this problem is beautifully solved by the precise design of the middle ear with its two diaphragms of just the right size and three connecting bones that provide the exact leverage required. These tiny bones, called the ossicles, are just right to do the job that enables us to hear properly. But the real wonder of these little bones is the fact that their size never changes from the time you were born. The ossicles of an adult and a child are just alike. As you grow and develop, every bone in your body grows and develops. Everyone, except your ossicles, they are fully developed at birth. Now, can this be just an accident? No, I don't think so. You know, Uncle Bob, I never really knew how wonderful my eyes and ears are. Not only our eyes and ears, fellas, but also the other parts of our body, too. The hand, as a tool that man can never duplicate for usefulness. A whole man has made mechanical hands that can perform such tasks as pouring a cup of coffee. You see, these machines are used to handle hot radioactive material that man can't get near. But that artificial hand can't thread a needle or perform a life-saving operation or paint a picture. Did you know our body has a chemical plant and it's far better than any that man has ever built? The body's chemical plant changes the food we eat into living tissues. It causes the growth of flesh and blood and bones and teeth. Why, it even repairs the body when parts are damaged by accident or disease. The food that we eat is changed into power for work and play. As this fuel is burned in the body's living furnace, energy is set free to drive our body machine. And the same remarkable furnace helps to keep us warm in winter. Why, even in freezing weather, our bodies will sometimes actually overheat. And when this occurs, the body's own cooling system takes over. Drops of perspiration pour from millions of tiny sweat glands in our skin. And with the help of this perspiration, the body's cooling system can keep our temperatures from rising for a limited time, even in heat that will fry a steak. And don't forget our heart. Our very life depends on the proper working of this amazing little instrument. Our heart is actually a little muscular pump, forcing blood through thousands of miles of blood vessels. Blood that carries food and oxygen to every part of our body. The heart pumps an average of 12 pints of blood every minute, and in one day pumps enough blood to fill a gasoline truck to overflowing. During your lifetime, your heart will pump enough blood to fill a string of tank cars 50 miles long. And just think, fellas, if you live to be 65 years old, your heart will have beaten two and one half thousand million times and without one single shutdown for repairs. Yes, we've been given a wonderful body machine which is made of many separate parts. In addition to those we've mentioned, think of our, our wonderful bone structure, the way in which our body manufactures its own lubricating fluid so our joints can move without squeaking. And then there's our voice box and our vocal cords which enable us to speak, our, our lungs and our, our blood cells, our nervous system. And of course, there's our brain, which in itself is 
almost beyond our ability to understand. I guess God went to a lot of trouble just to make our bodies so perfect. Yes, the way we are made does show his great wisdom and power. And we have a responsibility to take good care of these houses we live in. We should keep ourselves clean, not only from the ordinary kind of dirt that we all get on our hands and faces, but also from the kind that will spoil our hearts and minds. We should eat and drink only those things that are good for us. And we should try to keep ourselves well and strong by getting plenty of fresh air and good clean exercise. You mean like playing ball? <laughs> I mean like playing ball. You better scoot on out there and get that practice started. Okay, Uncle Bob, and thanks. So long, Uncle Bob. Still wish you could come. So long, fellas. 